What if I told you that an Irish saint spotted the Loch Ness Monster in the 6th century AD? I would say he definitely saw the Loch Ness Monster. And I would say that by even asking this question, we may be missing the entire point. Oh. I'm Matt. I am a Yale Law grad, a trial attorney, and a novelist. And I'm Brian. I'm an illustrator book cover designer, overall graphic designer. We team up to create books about dinosaurs, ancient cultures, and mysteries. Uh, seriously, we love this stuff. But we don't agree on everything. We are... <laughs> August 22nd, 565 AD. A group of Irish missionaries, led by St. Columba, are journeying to the farthest reaches of the known world, the highlands of Scotland. Their goal, to convert the notorious Pict people to Christianity. Now, you all may be familiar with the Pict people. They are most famous from their appearance as the Crazy Blue Warriors in the 2004 film King Arthur. St. Columba and his followers walk up to the River Ness, which leads directly out of the famous Loch Ness. They're discussing amongst themselves how they're going to get across the river. While they're doing this, a group of Picts comes up upon them. These Picts are burying one of their friends. While this friend was swimming in the river Ness, a giant water beast came and attacked him, killing him. St. Columba was not phased by this. He walks over to the man's body, lays his staff across the man's chest, and brings the man back to life. But, ever the pragmatist, St. Columba then tells one of his monks to swim across the river Ness and bring back a small boat for them all to cross. While this monk is swimming, however, the water beast is awakened. Alerted by the monk's splashing, this water beast surfaces and begins to charge the monk. The Picts and the followers of Columba on the shore are freaking out, screaming for the monk to try to get away. Columba, however, keeps his composure. He steps toward the shore and, in a commanding voice, tells the water beast, You will go no further. Do not touch this man. Leave at once. By this point, the water beast was almost within reach of the man. But at once, after hearing the saint's command, the water beast stops. As a later chronicler described it, the monster moved, quote, more quickly than if it had been pulled back with ropes. The monster retreats back into the depths of Loch Ness. Columba and his companions safely cross the river, and those Picts, well, they converted to Christianity right on the spot. This has gone down in history as the first sighting of the Loch Ness Monster. All right, Brian, I told you the story. What do you make of it? This may come as a shock to you, but I think a lot of it is very legit. <laughs> <laughs> Point number one. As we've discussed in previous episodes, I have said in that episode, I do think it is very plausible that plesiosaurs may have lasted into the modern era, specifically coming up rivers and getting trapped into lakes such as Loch Ness. So it would make perfect sense that St. Columba would have encountered such a beast. Another thing in favor of the story is the Picts. These people were living in the area, living around Loch Ness, and this seemed from this story that this was a beast that they have encountered and that they knew it was there in the depths. Uh, another point in the story's favor that I have heard. Now, just as a caveat, I read this point in a book called After the Flood by a man named Bill Cooper. I find this book very interesting and not at all reliable. So take this with a huge grain of salt. But he did point out that the account of the water beast's attack is pretty consistent with what we'd expect from a real animal, right? It, it was the behavior uh, that we'd see from like a gorilla or a bear defending its young. So the, the beast seems to be attacking the people who are too near to its territory. And then once it scares the people off, whether it's uh, this monk or that guy who got mauled, he sort of retreats back away. So he does the scare tactic, backs away. That seems like something a real animal would do. Well said, Matthew. Well said. Oh, thanks. I wasn't fishing for it, but I'll take it. <laughs> Fishing. I see what you did. There. Ah! Oh! <laughs> okay, now I'll give uh, some points where we should uh, maybe not invest too much stock in this being an historically accurate account. First of all, this account of St. Columba's encounter with the water beast uh, first comes from a chronicle of the life of St. Columba that was written by St. Adamnan over a century after it occurred. 
So obviously a lot can happen in a century. Uh, all the key actors would have been long dead. Uh, and in that amount of time, memories can fade, stories get exaggerated, legends can take root, and uh, some tall tales can start to creep in there. Again, it doesn't mean the account is inaccurate. It just it does give us a uh, reason to question. Second of all, this account of St. Columba resurrecting a man from the dead and then rebuking this Loch Ness monster are definitely two miraculous events. But when you look at the whole chronicle about the life of St. Columba, they're two of many, many events. The National Catholic Register gives a, a good list of some of these miracles attributed to St. Columba in this chronicle. Columba prophesied regularly and cured the sick, disabled, and lame. Once, when he didn't have wine for Mass, he miraculously changed water into wine. The monk also produced water from a rock, calmed storms at sea, conversed liberally with angels, subdued savage beasts like boars and serpents, provided several fishermen with a bounteous catch of fish, and brought peace to warring factions. Now, let me be clear. All these miracles could be true. I absolutely believe that miraculous things like this could happen. But it does give us a clear idea of what genre we're dealing with. Cards on the table. I am an Anglican, which means that my church traces its lineage all the way back through these very, very early churches founded by folks like St. Columba. So even apart from the Nessie sighting, I like St. Columba a lot. And I'm pretty familiar with a lot of these stories about St. Columba and other saints, missionaries during this time period. In this genre, it's this amalgamation of a lot of different things. These are hagiographies, uh, stories of holy people, that are filled with the miraculous and wondrous. Uh, the supernatural and the miracles permeate every aspect of them. They're a combination of actual historic events, like I, I think it's clear St. Columba was a real person. He founded real institutions and did real things. And it's also a combination of maybe pious legends about them, uh, folk tales attributed to them, tall tales, maybe legitimate miraculous signs that they did. And this is all set against the backdrop of those people's pre-existing mythology. So when you add that all together, they're very fascinating stories that I absolutely love. They absolutely are worth reading. They're valuable. They teach important lessons. But when you're trying to disentangle what quote unquote really happened from all the other stuff, it's kind of an impossible task and it's kind of missing the point. You know, the, the chronicler of St. Columba wasn't trying to tell a serious history. He was trying to tell a compelling story about a holy person. And in doing that, he absolutely succeeded. Yeah, absolutely. And totally agree with you on all that because, yes, we know he was a real person. He did great things. And some of those stories that have been told can be embellished. Like you have said, like this was a description of a story from 100 years previous to what the man was writing about. Yes, some of the things we need to take with a grain of salt, but a lot of these stories are filled with truth within them still. Mm -hmm. And like yeah. the core foundation of them, we can assume is true. Yes, mm -hmm. St. Columba went to Scotland. He converted the people group living in that area. We can agree he probably did some miraculous, amazing things. Some things probably got embellished as years went on, but I think we can agree he probably did miraculous, amazing things. And yeah, one and of those things was scaring away the Loch Ness Monster. <laughs> well, can I tell you, one of the things that gives me pause when I'm, you know, giving my spiel about, oh, it's hard to separate the symbolic elements from, you know, all this stuff. When I'm giving that spiel, the thing that gives me pause, there are lots and lots of hagiographies, you know, holy stories about saints doing miraculous things. There are other stories of saints slaying or confronting dragons. There's St. George, St. Theodore, St. Margaret, but that's almost all the lists. Like, there might be one or two others, but that's pretty much all the lists. We consider all of the saints out there, three or four other ones have stories about them slaying a dragon. So what are the odds that one of these very few saints, with the legend of him confronting a, you know, dragon monstrous beast, happens to be in the exact same spot where today there's the most famous cryptid in the world? That's what gives me pause. That makes you think, maybe there is something to this. I don't know. I know. And this might come as a shocker, but maybe those other saints did actually fight dragons. So maybe there's Ooh. some credibility to all these stories. Those um, sound like future episodes. But using that as a point for it, I would say that 
would make sense that it, since there are other stories that kind of carry that line throughout the history of these saints battling these great beasts, maybe it does give some more credibility to this story as well. Yeah, so let's wrap things up there then. So conclusions. Mine is going to be a lot fuzzier than usual. You know, usually I'm the lame one being like, oh, this probably isn't a dinosaur or anything cool. But here, I, I just... I can't arrive at a firm conclusion. Again, based on the genre here, we want to be careful about being too dogmatic that this has to be factual. Because again, the author of the Chronicles, that's not their primary goal. Their primary goal is to share a compelling story about a saintly person. But I do think it's possible that this happened. And again, the fact that it happens to be in this area, the River Ness, where Nessie would... I, that gives me pause. So I I have a hard time dismissing it completely. Let me put it that way. This pleases me, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> I love hearing you say that you think something was, <laughs> was legit. <laughs> I said possible, possible. <laughs> hey, I'll take that as a win every time. <laughs> For my conclusion, I would say with the most certainty I can that the, he did see a plesiosaur. And how much certainty can you say? As much as I can say without physically being there. <laughs> <laughs> you are writing with yeah. St. Adam Nan and his chronicle. And You're Saint like, Ad yes. Adam Nan, he's the man. <laughs> and I, right. I, I would say I give some pause on like some of the other parts of the story. Like, what, did he actually like, like, how did he scare it away? Did he just like yell and it just got scared and ran away? Like you were saying, did he actually raise the man from the dead? See, these are some of the things I'm like, maybe, maybe not, but... I think he definitely saw the Loch Ness Monster. Oh, look at us coming out pretty strongly in favor of St. Columba here. Look at us. Look at look us. At us. <laughs> Thank you again for watching. We really appreciate it. And again, because we are a new channel, we really, really would appreciate your uh, likes and your subscriptions. And if you want to check out another video we did recently, uh, check out this video we did on the Surish in Babylon, where we talk about other dragon reports and the one about the Japanese trawler that Brian mentioned, the one that might have brought in a plesiosaur. Also, please leave comments. Give us any other information that you might have on this story. Obviously, you're going to agree with us since even Matt <laughs> thinks it's possible. <laughs> so please feel free to leave any comments and let us know what you think.